I told a gal that um, I'd made a breastfeeding video and I was about to start doing a video on myths and stuff like that. And she said, well, something I hear a lot is about, you know, nipple piercings and, and you know, inverted nipples, the girls being scared that they won't be able to uh, you know, breastfeed. How does that work? Well, if you've got a pierced nipple, you take the jewelry out. Take the jewelry out, take, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've got two extra pores, milk is gonna come out of. Now the risk of infection, maybe I'm thinking like a freshly pierced nipple or something like that. Say if they take out the piercing and mm -hmm. there's like little spots of dried blood. Doesn't matter. Not at all. Not even a little. Okay, that's <laughs> that clears that up. I worked with one mom one time who said she was at a concert, you know, in the mosh pit or wherever she was, and unfortunately got those jewels ripped out, right? Was there duct damage or? You know, so sometimes, you know, with trauma like that, any kind of trauma, you can have some scar tissue that can potentially, you know, interfere. You know, for the most part, don't worry about it. Well, Inverted nipples? Ooh, those can be tricky because sometimes babies will have a hard time getting on past them, past the inverted portion of the nipple. Babies don't suck it out. They don't necessarily suck it out. Yeah. Although, given enough time, sometimes they can correct them. Sometimes what moms will do, you know, if they want to be really proactive, there's some things out there like supple cups, different things that they can use to try to draw out those nipples. This is the disclaimer. You always have to make sure that you know, your physician knows what you're doing. If there are any underlying health issues that you God, you won't jeopardize your pregnancy by inducing labor too early through nipple stimulation. Yeah. For the vast majority of women, that's not going to be the case. That was the disclaimer there. Okay. You know, pumping sometimes, right after the baby's born, can also help draw out those nipples more. You know how we don't call it nipple feeding, we call it breastfeeding. Yes. If you've got a baby who's gung-ho and able to do it, you can get a baby that can get on and get past the inverted part of that nipple and onto the areola, that breast can make milk just fine. Without any sort of intervention. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. Some interventions might help. I never count out anybody until we try. And so, other products? There are lots of things out there, you know, mother's milk, tea. Nipple shields, I've heard of. I think of those like training wheels. If you have a baby who's just not getting it done, okay. or you have a mom who's got like flattish nipples, there can be a variety of reasons why okay. you try, you know, and you introduce a nipple the, the, shield. The purpose of them are to... Give the baby something very rigid and firm so that it will trigger his sucking reflex okay. and enable mom and baby to hook up like a NASA space station. Yeah. All right. <laughs> they are not designed to be used forever. Yeah. Lance Armstrong doesn't, you know, have training wheels on his bicycle. They're good for premature babies. They are good for inverted nipples or flat nipples. Mm -hmm. They're good for babies who might have a little tongue tie, a weak sucking reflex. And other products you were gonna talk about? Breast shells are for really sore nipples. They keep things from rubbing against oh, gotcha. that very okay. sore nipple. Gotcha. All right. They even have shells that are designed to help coax out uh, inverted nipples. Supple okay. cups are like little suction cups that you put on that will put sustained pressure mm -hmm. on a nipple to help coax it out more, mm -hmm. you know, break up some of those adhesions mm -hmm. that some women have, nipple everters that you can use prior to helping a baby onto the breast. Something that I heard a lot about was like nipple butter or nipple cream or some, what, what, what was it, uh, nipple there, balm? Is that yes, what it is? Yes, Remember we were talking about how your nipples can get chapped, yeah, just like your and, lips. Mm -hmm. So you use an emollient that is compatible with, you know, being in baby's mouth. Coconut oil is really good. Oh yeah, that. that's right, coconut Medical oil. Medical grade lanolin is really good for yeah. that. There's a huge market, all kinds of nipple butters. Those are okay to use? They're okay to use. You know, once again, I'm a little bit more of a purist. I don't want to introduce a bunch of weird stuff into babies, you know, so I like keep it simple. Use nipple butter that's got, you know, essence of lavender, you know, half a dozen things in it. If it irritates your skin or if it irritates the baby for whatever reason, you're not going to know which one of those components was the, yeah. the culprit. Mm -hmm. We've used lanolin, medical grade lanolin. Mm -hmm. And probably. you say medical grade because I'm sure there's Amazon grade. You don't want to just, you know, put your hand in a little goat or a little sheep. Okay. Then, you know, yeah. lanolin, you know, like hand cream. I mean, there's lanolin in a lot of things. Yeah. Once in a while, I'll, I'll see somebody and they've got like Vaseline or petroleum jelly mm -hmm. by their bedside. And I'm like, you're not using that on your nipples, are you? And sometimes they're like, well, I was going to. I'm like, no! You Why know? not? Because that's not anything you'd ever eat. You don't want to put anything on your nipples that you don't want your baby getting at least a teeny little bit of. of. So Vaseline, no yeah, go. No go. No petroleum yeah. products. Yeah. If you're not willing to eat it by the spoonful, do not put it on your nipples. <laughs> <laughs> are you, are you done down eat lanolin by the spoonful? <laughs> Come on. True. Good point. All right. All right. I speak but I, hyperbole. I, Excuse I, me. I get what you're saying. So any product that says, please wipe it off before you put the baby to the breast, I would just avoid in general. Yeah. Any other kind of like, kind of other modalities you would use while breastfeeding? Do you use music or do you use anything else to help comfort the baby or anything like that? 
that's sweet. Like labor, you know, aromatherapy or music. Sure, why not? You know? Can't like tell you, if you were mocking me there. No, no, I'm not. I, I, I didn't know if that was something that was practiced because, you know, for, for stuff like we have a lot of non pharmacological interventions for pain and stuff like that uh, music, massage. Massage is very good for engorgement. Yeah. Gentle, light massage engorgement is what can happen in about day three, four, or five. When Painful. you've got a lot of edema in those breasts, you've got yeah. a little extra milk because the baby put in an awesome order. The body's like, I don't know how much to make. I'll just make as much as it seems, you know? Gotcha. It seems yeah, to yeah, be. Yeah. Until that settles down, you know, massage is a great way to okay. just make things feel better. So, oh, I've always thought this was my downfall as a lactation person. People usually are so formal, and, and I just tend not to be. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not quite too formal <laughs> on my uh, and, and I think you should be real. I mean, there's, I think too many people are, they, they try and be too... Clinical. Uh, yeah, too clinical, and, and that shit's boring. Yep. Uh, you just gotta be real. Another tip I give is that I say, first side is dinner, the second side is dessert. We'll offer both breasts at a feeding. Let the baby have as much dinner as the baby wants, <laughs> okay. all right? Don't be quick to try to yeah. snatch the plate, right? Burp the baby, let the baby have five minute cat nap, mm -hmm. and then offer the dessert cart. Offer, offer the, the second. <laughs> Some babies will take it and take it gangbusters. Some yeah. babies, nah, not interested, totally. Yeah. And you want to feed the baby. To number make one rule, sure. right? Oh, that is the number one rule. And that's when I would recommend formula. That's when I will say it's not happening for whatever reason yeah, in this moment. That's when you offer some formula as a supplement as you work on helping yeah, yeah, supporting yeah. the baby and getting mom's milk supply. So it's, it can be used as a supplement. Right. Just, just to remind, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's I, not I, either I, or. I think it's a misconception that it is, that it's like I'm either going to breastfeed or I'm either going to, you know, use formula. I think it feels like it to a lot of women. Like, oh, fine. I introduced one bottle of formula. Yeah, that's so it, I'm that's done. it. Yeah. No, it does not have to be that way. Any amount of breast milk is worth the effort for your baby. Aside from all the advantages, right? All the protection against reproductive issues, postpartum mood disorders. I like to tell them one that they don't always know of, and that is that when you're an ancient grandma, great grandma, your bones are going to be stronger. You're going to have protection against osteoporosis. Is that right? Because you breastfed. Yes, sir. How does that work? <laughs> Think about um, the dynamic nature of bone remodeling, you know, and regeneration. It places demand on your bone. Oh, it does? Yeah, that's right. Because the baby's getting some calcium. Supply and demand. That's why we're supposed to do weight-bearing exercise. The more demand you place yeah. on your bones, yeah, yeah, yeah. the stronger they become. Breastfeeding puts demand on your bones. I, I've seen those guys, you know, this, they're martial artists or, I don't know, they do this stuff where they hit their forehead with the sticks and they strengthen their bones. <laughs> and I'm like, they have some strong-ass bones after that because they can literally take sticks and and smack them as hard as they can against yeah. the forehead, no problem. No, thank you. I don't know if your yeah. bones gotta get that strong. Let's just keep I'm them just... from breaking when we fall down. Yeah, exactly. You know? Breastfeeding is also one of the known things to help prevent breast cancer. Correct. Yes, and there's not too many of those. You know, uh, like 70% yeah. of all breast cancers can't be traced to anything. There was a very good longitudinal study out of China where people typically breastfeed a couple of years. So they had a population to study. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, the amount of reduction in breast cancer was so shocking. And they kind of extrapolate out that what if you did nurse three, four years? Or what if you nursed three kids two years yeah, apiece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got like eight years worth of breastfeeding under your belt. Your breast cancer risk is really reduced. Yeah, wow. That's huge. It I is mean, if that's huge. not the selling point, I mean, I think that's enough right there. I mean, if you're not sold on that, shoot. Any other tips you want to share before I start going on with a few goofy questions? If I think of some, I'll blur them out. Okay. Your three least favorite vegetables. <laughs> Beets. Beets? Beets. One. Asparagus. I have a love-hate relationship with asparagus. Well, then that doesn't count if you All love right, it. Because I really like vegetables in general. See, I'll eat almost anything. Really? I really draw the line at beets. Beets, beets, and beets. Beets, beets, and beets. Beets, I'm just beets, not and hat. I kind of avoid asparagus. Okay. Three favorite fruits. Strawberries, blueberries, and bananas. I love Strawberries, them. blueberries, and bananas. I love them. In the summertime, I always say I'm on the strawberry diet. I can have like one of those giant flats. I definitely do a banana a day. Yeah. Blueberries I don't get because, I mean, it doesn't matter how big of a thing I get, it's gone within oh. like 10 minutes. Yeah. It can't stop. It's like a bag of chips. And I'm why just, would you? Well, because they're expensive. <laughs> can't afford to be buying that big a thing of blueberries. I will spend any amount of money on blueberries and strawberries. <laughs> I don't care. I love them and they love me. 
Olives. Are they fruits or oh, vegetables? Oh, olives! Ooh, they got they pits, got right? In the middle. Yeah. They might be like an avocado, which is technically a fruit. Regardless, I f***ing hate them. Olives are disgusting. I can't stand them. Mushrooms, I can't stand them. You know what? I don't like them raw. So they, they freak me out but raw. I love them cooked. Cooked? Oh my, I eat them like crazy cooked. Cooked? I, I can see, but raw is just, that blows my mind. <laughs> lactation consultant question. Up next, where does one find a lactation consultant? You know, it's like the secret handshake at Fernando's Hideaway. <laughs> Ask your doctor to refer you. Go online. Go to ILCA, which is the professional organization that most of us belong to. And ILCA, what is that? I -L ILCA. ILCA. I L C A. International Lactation Consultants Association. Okay. So you go to that website yeah, and you can and find you, one in yeah, your local area. And you ask for your area and hopefully they'll hook you up. Is it, is it a pricey thing? Does it cost a lot to get a lactation consultant? A lot of medical insurance will not cover outpatient lactation visits. One does. Should I say who it is? Yes. <laughs> Aetna. 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 They will cover outpatient lactation. I think that's important for people to know if they're making that choice. Yeah, it's fairly pricey. I mean, I think. If I had to just give you a very rough yeah. ballpark, about $200 per consult, which can last like an hour and a half. And okay. then many times there is a second follow-up appointment that is also part of that first initial. But it's not like a weekly thing. Money. Oh my God, no. I mean, you might have a follow-up in a week or you might have a okay. follow-up in two days. And is the follow-up a little more affordable or is it the same price? It really depends on the practitioner. Okay. Lactation consultants, they set their price. Mm -hmm. Some have phone consultations. Some will charge for that, some don't. It is very much an individual. If you can get it down with a IBCLC for $200, you get there so fast, you know, so it is so worth it. And many lactation consultants work in clinics, and so you can see them in a clinical setting, and then your medical insurance very frequently will pay for it. You know, like a stand clinic, you know, you go see... A pediatrician or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you say outpatient, you're talking about... Out of the hospital. Out of the hospital, in you're doing it on setting. your own. They're just not coming to your home. There's a real advantage sometimes to having them come to your home. Now they're seeing you wherever you're nursing. Oh, they get you comfortable in the chair you're sitting. I don't know how many times mommy said to me, oh my God, I love your chair. If I had this chair at home, I don't know how, it would all go so much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or, oh my gosh, I never can nurse like this at home. Well, you know, you get somebody to come to your house and maybe you then can yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're working in your environment. Exactly. What? Oh, that's a good question. If you were arrested with no explanation, what would your family and friends think you would have done? <laughs> Oh my God, they just got a call, said, come bail me out. Yeah, what would they say? Oh, okay, we know why. I don't know, Nancy was at some political protest for <laughs> better healthcare coverage. I don't know. That works. Although, although, in the state of Washington and in many other states, any place the mother has the right to be, so does her nursing infant, we are protected under the state legislature. And the policies for is state to state. Yes, a, a nice majority of states protect a woman's right to breastfeed in public. Different topic. Okay. Favorite type of cheese? Ooh, um, gorgonzola. So Good. Because it's not as strong as this hardcore blue cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It melts well. Oh, yeah. man. Do you have any nicknames? <laughs> You know, there was a typographical error when I was in nursing school, and I got a Nancy spelled with a V instead of a C. So I was Nan V. Nan V. Nan V for a okay. while. And I have this really cute nurse. She's like, gotcha. Fancy Nancy! Fancy Nancy! <laughs> all right, so. You're all out of toilet paper. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> You're refilling the toilet paper. Over or under? Over! And that's because in my childhood days, you had two ply toilet paper, and you had all those pretty decorations on it. And if you put it under, uh. then you wouldn't see the beautiful designs. It was only printed on the top layer. The reason why I decided under was because I saw a video cat walking up. <gasps> yes! Scratching at the toilet paper. The whole thing unraveled. <laughs> I don't have a cat, but I still... You know what? Toddlers, too. Uh, They're like little kitties, too. Yeah. Really? I can see that, yeah. If you were on Gilligan's Island... <laughs> and I had a choice between the skipper, no. <laughs> Gilligan, and the professor, who would it be? <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> or Mr. Howell. I'd go for the professor. I love, yeah. I love a brilliant line. Kind of stud. My question was... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Who would you be? Who would I be? I'd be the professor. What is something that you think everyone just looks stupid doing? I think people look really stupid when they're at a nice restaurant with a date and they're both texting. <laughs> it's a very good one. I'm like, man, are you texting each other? <laughs> Why are you out? Why are you with this person? Yeah. I am gravely concerned about our population. <laughs> <laughs> with good reason. You know, 
If you had to give up one thing that you do every day, what would it be? I could say uh, I could give up showering because I hate taking it. I shower every day, but I hate, <laughs> I hate doing it. And I probably eat some kind of junk food every day. Really, that should be what I should give up. And like sugar. Let's just make it simple. I gave up chocolate for Lent one year, and I thought, I'd be able to do that. Chocolate? I mean, how do I eat chocolate? I collapsed on day three. I was very oh humbled after God. that. I had no idea. I was so nuts about chocolate. <laughs> What's your favorite flavor ice cream? Mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. I do you eat pizza? Heck yeah. Do you fold it? No. You don't. I have been known, in fact, to eat my pizza with a fork and knife. What? Yeah. You folding pizza? That is an East Coast thing. My it husband is. does it. He's from Connecticut. He folds his pizza. I think he folds it so he can get twice as much in it as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I stopped folding it because of that. I was like, I'm just eating these pizzas in like three bites. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I use a fork and a knife so I can slow down, slow down. What is the accomplishment that you're most proud of? I think because I came into nursing kind of later on in life. Yeah. And I thought if I really want to get in a hospital and get as upstream as I can, I got to get my RN. You know, my father was a doctor and my brother was the, sort of the golden child who was supposed to have been the next doctor in the family. Yeah. And you know, that didn't happen and my father was so disappointed. Uh -huh. And I'm like, daddy, if you'd worked half as hard on me, you'd have the medical person. Uh -huh. I said at one point to him when I was a little girl, gotcha. I said I wanted to be a nurse. And he said, oh, don't do that, be a doctor. And I'm like, I don't wanna be a doctor. And then my mother said, no, no, why don't you be a ballet dancer? Are you crazy? <laughs> it took me a while. I mean, I was really kind of afraid. Yeah, of it's, it's intimidating at first. I thought, you know what, they can't all be smarter than me. <laughs> One of the things that helped me out a lot was, I had done my first couple of clinicals and I was in lab. One of the clinical instructors said, you know, cause someone said, oh, I'm just so nervous when I'm there. And she said, just listen, take a look around and look at some of the nurses <laughs> that are working. <laughs> Are you brighter than them? You think you could be brighter than them? I was like, oh yeah, God. I went back to school in my late 40s <laughs> and kicked ass. There you go. Although I did it with a lot of high anxiety. My best friend in nursing school was that she got her RN later in life. She kicked ass. She was yes. like one of the best students and got along with her so well. Such a good experience. I guess it's fresh enough. Man, I'm proud of that. And if my father was still alive, you know, I'd like to think that he'd be at this point in the game very proud too. Yeah. I have this cute little golden book and it's Nurse Nancy. It's a little golden book and it's about yeah. this little girl who likes to play nurse and I always used to. And they've reissued it now. Every time I get a Christmas present from somebody, they give me like Nurse Nancy. I've got like three copies of this book. Gotcha. <laughs> if you had one thing, one piece of advice to say to the entire world, breastfeeding or not, lactation or not, what would it be? Live your life as if everything is possible. That's good. You know? I like that. Live your life as if what you want to do is already done.